Recently, I went to a gigantic indoor water park that is one of the biggest indoor water parks at about 125,000 square feet. And it's one of the best water parks in the country. And it's in the Poconos in uh, Pennsylvania. And it was built for about $163 million as part of a much larger development that includes the Camelback Lodge um, that has uh, you know 453 hotel rooms or keys, as we call it. And the thing that is interesting to me is that this is such a big investment that you have to do it in the right way. Otherwise, you're not going to get to the impact that you're trying to get to, which is to have this giant indoor water park um, that is really unique. But if you spend too much money on the shell of the building, you're not going to be able to do all of these crazy attractions that are put inside of it. And so when I was there, I spent a bit of time just sort of as I'm looking around, you know, I kind of can't help myself, but look at the way the building is put together because the building itself, we want the building to be nice. We want it to have a nice sort of atmosphere, a nice feel when you're inside of it, but it also can't be something that blows your budget so that you don't have enough budget left to do, you know, what we're looking at here, which is all of this sort of crazy water park stuff. And so how do they do that? And again, I'm interested in this because most of the work I do is involving trying to put a very ambitious vision together, which I would say this falls into that category, even though this isn't my project. So when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at the way the building is put together so that the specialty uh, can be put inside of it. And what I mean by that is that there's this company, in this case, this ADG group, who is the one who is designing and installing the structure itself. And so, you know, how do we go about doing that? Um, some things that I wanted to point out when you look at this structure, you know, number one, it's got this clear plastic roof, which is allowing a lot of natural light in. It's allowing a lot of solar heat gain. And that's a good thing when you're trying to keep the building's interior at 84 degrees, which is, you know, warm enough so that you can be getting in and out of these pools and not getting that chill um, that you might get if you're like walking out of your bathroom that's all warm into, you know, another part of your house or something like that. And so they're letting a lot of heat in, which is good in the winter at least. And they also have this very large sort of duct system that is all running back to, um, you know, central heating and cooling systems. And it gets distributed uh, from the branch, from the mains to these sort of branches. Again, in a similar way to the way these sprinkler heads are being distributed, where you've got these mains for the sprinklers that are going down, and then it basically branches off to provide the appropriate amount of coverage, basically an invisible grid of sprinkler heads in order to have this thing meet code. And so from uh, air, air conditioning, meaning are we heating or cooling the air, there's a lot of solar gain, which is good for heating in the winter. There's these uh, large ducts, which you can see they get, they start sort of very big in diameter and they sort of step down periodically as the air is being distributed out of it in the supply vents, which are sized in a way that they're narrow. They're trying to sort of project the air down um, as far as it can go. They're sort of throwing the air, if you will. I am a little surprised that they didn't have some sort of like a, a low velocity, large diameter ceiling fan that would be able to push the warm air down. There's also other systems like these sort of air pairs and different things that are trying to keep the warm air at the sort of occupant level, meaning closer to the ground, so that you're not just overheating at the at the ceiling level. So, you know, there's always things that um, can be done. That's one that I noticed that was not part of this project. But some other things that we can look at when we look at the structure of the building. So the building structure for any building is probably one of the most significant expenses for any construction project. And so the way that you strategize what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, how you're going to build it, what materials, how many layers of materials are required. It's all very important. And so some of the things I was noticing in this, um, you can see that it's this wooden structure that's holding up the plastic uh, roof. And those wooden beams are resting on these steel beams, which are then transferring to these girders or this big truss in this case. And so you've got the wood, again, the wood goes onto these beams, which goes onto these girders, which goes onto these columns, which goes down to the ground to hold everything up. 
You can also see on the far end over here and over here, the roof itself is not sitting on the walls of the building. So the blue walls of the building here, it's actually its own structure that I believe is independent of the building envelope or the building wall and the building shell. The reason why we would do it that way from a from a strategic construction and design point of view, it's interesting to sort of think about construction as strategy, but I do think of it that way because from an owner point of view, you have to be strategic to get to this result. And so how are they doing this? Basically, I'll start with the roof itself. The roof itself is not sitting on the walls. It's on its own structure. And what that means is that it is not fireproof. So you don't see that sort of popcorn stuff sprayed on the outside of it. You don't see drywall wrapping the columns. You don't see a lot of things that you might see in say a parking garage where you have things that are sitting above it. So if you had a floor above this, if people were above it, it would be a totally different situation. But effectively, the roof is only required to hold itself up. It's not holding anything else up. And therefore, if it were to fail in like a catastrophe, the roof would fall down, but the building as a whole wouldn't fall down. And therefore, that generally means that you don't need to have the same fire rating as like a structural wall or a column that's holding up a floor above it. And the way that they're doing that is by a few sort of tricks. So number one, you can see that the base of the, the columns are actually concrete, so poured in place concrete, and then the steel is sitting on top of it. And this is pretty consistent throughout. This one is even taller. What that does is a few things. It, number one, it shortens the effective length of the steel column, because if you imagine the column wants to buckle just as if you were putting a bunch of weight on something. It wants to basically bend and buckle. And so the longer the column is, the more it wants to buckle and therefore the more material is needed to keep it from buckling. So it gets to be a bigger column. So by shortening the distance effectively to this rather than this, which if you think about it, it may not look like much, but that might be 10, 15 maybe even 20% of some of these columns in terms of their effective length, that's a big deal. It also potentially means that the column from a code point of view is a shorter column. And if you have shorter columns, meaning usually about 30 feet or less, you often don't have to have the same requirements from a code perspective as well. And so there may be some trickery here around the way that the base of the column and the way that effectively the floor, you know, quote unquote, has been raised up quite a bit so that the column itself is bearing at this level, which is, you know, about 10 feet above the actual floor level. A couple other things um, from the inside of the structure, the, the building itself, again, we've said the roof is separate from the building envelope or the, the walls, I should say. The same thing is true for the slides. So these crazy slides, um, all of this gray structure is independent of the building entirely. There's all sorts of, lad uh, not ladders, but stairs and things like that in the back here. All of it is sitting inside of the building envelope, meaning it's not being hung from the building. And therefore, in the very same way, it does not have the same sort of a fire rating that would be needed if it was something that was actually holding up a floor. And when you get into unique projects like a water park or other amusements, the codes often get very particular. So without sort of getting into that, just at a very high level, it's interesting the way that we as builders, as developers, as architects can very specifically categorize different building components so that they either do or don't sort of fall into the category of what's doing what, like as in what is holding up the vertical loading or gravity, what is doing the lateral work, meaning the building sliding back and forth, and then separately having this structure that's holding up the amusement itself, which is this water slide. And just like the roof, if the water slide were to collapse, it's not that nobody would get hurt, but the building doesn't fall down. And that means that it doesn't have the same requirement as say the envelope of the building, or again, the lodge where it's holding up multiple floors. And so one of the things that you can see if you start, so just keeping in mind the wall is, are these blue walls here. And so if we look at what that is actually made out of, um, and you take a picture like this one that I took, 
a couple things that we can notice. So number one, again, you see that the wooden roof, which is sprinklered, but not connected to the blue wall, which is a precast concrete uh, panel, probably about eight to 10 feet wide, probably about 40 feet long in this direction, because that's how it's easiest to ship on the back of a truck. So these are made off site, they're brought in, tip, 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 the building gets put up relatively quickly. Additionally, you can see there's also a concrete block down here at the, at the ground level where the bathroom entrance is. You know, that's the structure of the wall. It's the finish of the wall. It gets painted. You know, there's less issues with moisture. So they've done a good job of trying to have surfaces that don't have a lot of drywall, don't have a lot of moisture issues. Um, you know, they're painted. They can be sort of cleaned relatively easily. And then furthermore, we've talked about how the, the distribution of air through these ductwork uh, supply ducts is one thing, but the return is actually happening at a series of these sort of very large, you know, again, probably eight feet wide by probably about two to three feet deep um, return areas where there's a pre-filter. So this filter here is on the outside and it's collecting all sorts of dust and debris. And in this case, a mylar balloon that is being basically sucked in, brought down and then shot outside into um, the air handlers, which are, you know, heating and cooling or recovering heat or whatever the case is. And so, you know, in the building itself, there's actually a lot of kind of smart things going on when you look at it, because what they're doing is they're trying to not spend a lot of money on the structure of the building. They're doing, they're building a very efficient shell, meaning precast concrete done off sites, openings are carved into it for windows, you know, over here. There's uh, louvers that are being, I'm sorry, that's being blocked a little bit, but these windows you can sort of see over here, the louvers above them, which are there for smoke evacuation, if there um, needs to be that. You know, there's all sorts of things when you have atriums and, you know, large areas for getting uh, smoke out in an emergency. But again, it's all in the service of trying to let the water park people make this crazy water park. You know, people walk in and they, yes, they can see that it's this very light, airy space, which is a great feeling um, being in there. It feels really nice. But, you know, if you spend too much money on that, you're not going to have the budget to build all of this stuff, you know, the kids area and this sort of wave pool and this giant up and down water slide that is really fun, I can vouch for, or this giant Venus flytrap, which is actually terrifying. So, you know, these are all different ways of looking at how to strategically build a project. And when I'm doing the work that I do, this is a project we did in Chicago and some of the similar things that we were strategizing that were often lessons learned from other projects that I can point out in this project are, you know, these on the exterior of the project, these are a about 40 foot sandwich metal panels. So the outer finish, the interior finish and the insulation is all in one sandwich panel that you can see, you know, again, it's about, I think about six feet wide in this case, they are sized so that these large openings are put into them and they are on the outside of the building structure itself, which is this series of columns that are fireproofed in this case. Um, because they're just doing certain, the, just because of the work that they're specifically doing. You can see the way that this mezzanine is also uh, had spray fireproofing attached or sprayed onto it. These are all trade offs. You know, we at one point had thought about, you know, do we put drywall over some of this or try to exp uh, keep it hidden? In this case, for budget reasons um, and just very, for simple reasons, it was left exposed. The ceiling itself also, and the roof itself, you can see is also not fire rated in the same way. It's open web bar joist because this is a lightweight uh, part of the roof. Whereas the other side of the project, uh, meaning basically from this girder or beam that is spanning between these columns, these are wide flange beams because they're actually hanging the climbing wall from them in certain places because that was the most efficient way to engineer the climbing wall. We had talked about a little while ago, how the 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 structure of the the water park was all freestanding. In this case, it's a mix of freestanding and attached to the building, which again, right there, you're talking about different requirements. 
One of the other things that we're doing here that we do a lot is adding pre-filters, which again, we saw that in the, um, in the water park too, where this is a filter where I'm not saying it's easy to get to because it's almost 50 feet off the ground, but it's a lot easier to get to and a lot cheaper to replace than the RTU that it's feeding air into. And so, you know, it's just about trade-offs in, in construction because, you know, it's going to be hard to make it perfect. So how can we do it as best we can within the budget that we have so that the focus is not on any of what I was just talking about. It's not on the bar joist. It's not on the filter. It's not on, is this a beam or a bar joist or is it fireproofed or not? It's on this, which is what we're trying to have the impression that we're giving off. Like that's what we're really trying to focus on here. And just another example of something like this is in the Seattle Public Library. This is an example I look at a lot when I talk about building structure and fire ratings because this is a big glass structure with, you know, if this, this diamond grid on the outside gets too thick, it doesn't really work because you won't be able to see in or out of it very well. And so they've got these sort of program blocks, which we'll look at in a minute, and these are all sort of stacked up in a fairly traditional way. But the spaces in between them are these big glass reading rooms, as they call them. And those need to be open. Those need to not be uh, boxed in by too much structure and all the sort of practical stuff uh, that we're talking about. And so when we're looking at the interior photos of the finish, you can see that the, the steel is not fire rated. Uh, in the same way that the columns that are holding up those program blocks we were just talking about, like this giant one here, these are much more traditional in terms of, you know, the use of concrete to achieve certain fire ratings, the use of drywall and fireproofing. The, the steel itself for, for the glass is effectively holding itself up. And you've got these larger sort of tilted beams or columns or whatever you want to call them that are doing more work. And therefore, they also have a different requirement from a structural and a fire uh, rating point of view. And so what's important, I think, when I'm looking at this kind of thing is if you had to start, you know, just really quickly, if you started adding layers and layers and layers to all of this thing, all of a sudden you don't see any more glass. You know, and it, and by the way, good luck doing that in every one of these squares or diamonds across the whole structure. You know, it just gets to a point where the idea isn't buildable anymore at a price that's reasonable. And so that's why it's so important to be looking at construction as a strategic part of the design process so that we can be looking at buildability uh, as well as design intent simultaneously so that the effect we actually deliver for the people who are using the project, which is, you know, this kind of an image is genuine and it's achievable and it's not this sort of gilded thing that we can't actually get to. And so I just wanted to share a few thoughts after visiting the Aquatopia water park, because it's um, a pretty interesting space. And I, the more I looked at it, the more it seemed like there were actually some very smart things going on in terms of the way that the building itself was conceived, designed, documented, executed to allow the water park to really sort of come through and have the budget left to do that. And so if this is interesting, please like and subscribe to the channel because that's very helpful for me to get feedback on, you know, that this is interesting to you. I really appreciate it. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.